And when I spoke to Lara Catena about their work with Old Vineyards and Marcel Selection, what struck me is that she's not a sentimental person. She's a, a doctor by training. She has a really a kind of a scientific and, and rather a sort of objective and practical approach. But she absolutely is championing old vines and also has worked with the basically the recuperation, the rescue of genetic material from a vineyard that they're trying to keep in the ground with a grower for ages. And just at the time when he was actually digging up, he was basically selling it to for sort of luxury property. They actually went in and took cuttings from this vineyard so that they could capture this genetic material. So I'd say Lara has a, another perspective, which I think is really important to hear from, from such a you know respected, commercially successful and, and high quality producer. So I will hand over. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Laura, are you with us? Yes, there she is. Fantastic. A, a couple of big thank yous to Laura. First of all, Laura is on holiday. On holiday, I think in Venice. And those of you who know Laura will know that I sometimes think there are three Lauras in the world because she works so incredibly hard that she's popping up everywhere. I mean, we we counted this up. She's done 43 Zoom, uh, sorry, Instagram lives, one of which was with me and it was amazing and had the it biggest was. viewing stats. Um, your following <laughs> around the world is amazing. Over, over two, you've done 247 Zoom calls and that's with Zoom tastings around the world. So Laura is always busy. She's very, very distinguished human being, you know, Harvard and Stanford educated, a biologist, a physician. She was a casualty doctor and still practices as a medical doctor in San Francisco, although slightly less these days because she's so busy running Running everything else. Uh, she's the managing director of Bodega Catena Zapata, obviously, and she was the person who set up the Catena Institute of Wine in Argentina, which we're going to hear more about. On top of that, she's also an author. She's written how many books is it now? Three? I've got three. Yes, uh, the, the, third one, one, the third one is coming soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> about so my back. She's written two award-winning books, and there's another one which is uh, which is on Malbec. Three children, Laura. I never, I never know how you do it. Anyway, it's fantastic to have you, even on your holiday. And you're going to share with us details of this incredible vineyard, the Angelica Vineyard. I think it'd be very interesting to talk about Angelica and maybe Adriana. I think we're going to do yeah. that to compare and contrast these two very different sites and and vine age. Over to you yeah. to tell us a little bit about the history of the Catenas, how they ended up in Argentina, etc. Lovely to see. Good. Well, I'll tell you, Tim, that my husband says that Laura Catena's secret is ignoring her husband. <laughs> so to all the husbands out there, don't let your, your or partners, I think it, it can go both ways. Yeah. Uh, yes, very good. So let's see, shall I go ahead and share the screen right now, Tim? Yeah, share the screen and okay. let's, let's have a look. Let's get a little picture okay. of Angelica up there on the screen. Okay, there she very is. good. Let's uh, yeah. make it big. And first of all, I want to say that, uh, Dylan, if you want to come do some research in Argentina, let us know. Oh, wait, I'm showing the wrong thing now. Here, wait one second. Let's see, I just want to but uh, that was really fascinating. And, uh, you know, I'm very interested, Tim, because we definitely find that old vines are lower yielding. So what Dylan has found in Australia is amazing, you know, that a 100 year old vineyard would produce the same as a six year old vineyard. Uh, that's extraordinary. I haven't heard of that. And so I am very, very curious to talk to Dylan. So Dylan, please, let's make sure that we, we connect soon. So are, are I sharing okay now? Yeah, we can Tim? see her. We okay. need to know which, where is Angelica? Is she the so, one in the so, middle? Yeah, so she, she's, we are very small, the Catena. So she, all the boys are taller than her and she was wearing heels in this photo. But so Angelica Zapata is my grandmother who I never, because she unfortunately died, died in a car accident in her thirties, but she was a very fierce educator and she really believed in upward mobility that you know, if, if somebody went to school and studied, you know, the, the future was theirs. And she was dedicated to viticulture, I'm sorry, to education much more than to viticulture and actually sort of looked down on the family business of making wine because it wasn't academic enough. But uh, here she is with her students and our vineyard, the Achelica Vineyard, which is at this point about 100 years old, is named after her, you know, in, in honor of her, but also um, because you know she is the person that that gave us this inspiration to study, and I think that a lot of what we've done at Catena, you know, reviving the Malbec variety, studying the altitudes and the populations, comes from this tradition of study. And uh, I really enjoyed Dylan's work, and and I have to say to to all wine producers that 
the more research we can do, you know, we don't have time to do what the Cistercian monks did, you know, the trial and error over 400 years. And if we want to save these vines, continue farming in many of our regions, we will need to do research. And I think really Australia has, you know, the University of Adelaide has, has been so incredible at doing research in Australia, but also sharing their research with other parts of the world. And that's very important and necessary. So Tim, I'm waiting for you to ask me some kind of a question or tell me to go. No, next. I, I think move on to the next uh, next, next slide. I, mean, I, I just think one interesting thing about just this history of, of immigration, you know, to, to the new world from Northern Italy, if you think that the Gallows, the Mondavis, the Catenas, you know, all, all came to the new world, you know, with that wave of immigration really, you know, between, between the end of the 19th century and the middle of the, well, uh, yeah, and the, and the middle of the 20th really, I mean, just, how how much wine culture came yeah. came with them? Did they all plant vineyards? Pretty much anybody came from Northern Italy. Was it just part of the things they did? Well, so if you think of, of the history of Mendoza as a farming region, it actually uh, dates back to the native peoples of mm. Argentina who were part of the Inca empire. Mm. So they actually established irrigation canals that drained the water from the glaciers in the Andes. And without these irrigation canals that were probably built in the, you know, 15th century before there were any Spaniards there, we wouldn't have agriculture in Mendoza. So really they start the, the agricultural tradition in our region. Then we have the, the Jesuits and, and the, the Spaniards that come to Argentina and they are very good vintners. They make wine and actually they're, they're, I, I know there's people from other Latin American countries here and, and they know the story of how the Spanish king basically outlawed farming and viticulture in the, the new world because the new world, he wanted yeah. the whole market for the Spanish wine. Uh, and this was a big problem in Mexico because Mexico was much more important than Argentina or Chile back then. In fact, Chile was much more important to, than Argentina to the Spanish. And, and Peru, uh, right? And Peru, yes. Peru and, and Mexico were the most important countries to the Spaniards. So they, they really blocked winemaking in Mexico. But in Argentina, we were very far away, not very important. And so actually in Argentina, winemaking continued and th there were these priests that really had the knowledge and the know-how. And then when the Jesuits were expelled, you know, the knowledge was transferred to the, to the local Argentinians. Now, in, as you said, in, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, we have this you know, gigantic immigration, more from Italy than from Spain, but also from Spain because the language was similar. And if you look at the numbers, at the time of independence, there's 500,000 people living in Argentina. So it's, it's a small population. And actually between the 19th and 20th century, we have 6 million immigrants. You know, mostly from Italy and Spain, but, you know, we also had British people, Russians, people from all over. And these Italians and Spaniards brought their winemaking traditions. Okay. But had, had there not already been this farming region, yeah. nothing of what they wanted to do would have been possible. Okay. But they, they brought technology, they brought know-how. The first Malbec came in the middle of the 19th century. So if you, if you go back to the 16th century, which is when we started making wine uh, in Mendoza and Argentina, it was mostly the Criolla varieties, which are called Pais in Chile. Um, but then it's in the 19th century that we get some of the, the, you know, the fine French varieties like Malbec, Semillon, and then these immigrants come and establish, you know, a, a real strong tradition of winemaking in Mendoza, which today makes about 70% of the wine in Argentina. Okay, now tell us about this map. I mean, that we're... For those, for people who don't know Mendoza, just explain where Lunlunta is and, and how yeah. Maipú maybe is, is different from, from the Uco Valley. Yeah, so in Argentina, the original vineyards that are planted, you know, in the 19th and early 20th centuries are, are planted near the roads because anytime you went far away, like the Uco Valley was considered like, I don't know, practically going to another planet. It would be like us going to, to Mars today. It was so, so far away. The, the Uco Valley, which is today the, the, the best known qualitative region for Mendoza. So most of the vineyards were planted near the road and the railway and near the city. So this vineyard is at around, I should say in meters, correct? For yeah. this conference. So this is around 900 meters elevation. You know, some of our highest vineyards are 1500 meters further south and west. So this is near the city of Mendoza. That's why if you look to, to the north, you'll see that there's a lot of building. You know, we're about a 
a 20 minute drive from from the city but this was very rural at the time when it was planted you know in the early 1900s and lulunda is considered a somewhat warmer region and part of the primera zona which is our traditional region you know today many of the vineyards have moved to the uco valley to cooler climate regions but this is one of the best known regions most traditional most classic yes just t tell us how far we're, we are away from the river here from the river mendoza yeah so actually if you see all the yeah. way at the bottom you see this darker area that's the rio mendoza and so if you look down the vineyard you see first one lots one and two and then you go down to lot 20 and 18, which are marked at the bottom, right next to there. And actually, I can show another picture here. So this is how close we are to the Rio Mendoza, you know, literally the vineyard, you know, abuts on the river. And if you think about how this vineyard would have been planted, usually the vineyard was first planted near the road. And then when you had a little more money and, you know, this was the situation with all the immigrants, you never plant, let's say you you were lucky enough to be able to buy 10 hectares. You never had the money to plant all 10 hectares right away. So you would first plant wherever it was closer to the road, which is here, the parcels one and two. And then you would make a selection of the vines and you would plant three and four, five and six, and then you'd keep on going. And in this particular case, you know, they ran out of land with 18 and 20. And so those are the last parcels planted. But what's really interesting is that when, when we first uh, started studying this vineyard, it was all old. And the quality of these two parcels by the river was so much better in terms of the, the population of vines, you know, the flavors, the quality of wine we were getting, that I think there is, there is a correlation between this, you know, picking, making a massage selection by the eye and the taste and planting and then doing another selection, another selection, so that the last part planted in the vineyard would have been the better quality. And, and haven't you, a lot of your massal selections for your other vineyards come from yes. those two blocks, aren't they, from 18 and 20? Yes, so, so 18 and 20 are the sort of the mother lots where we have taken massal selections. We, we've done everything. We've, we did clones, so we have 135 different cuttings. Then we have a massal selection with, which we've planted in all our vineyards. And then we also have 15 clones, which we sometimes will plant one per parcel in different vineyards. And the idea of doing this was uh, that we knew that this was the part of the vineyard where we thought um, we could get the best, this was where we were getting the best wine. So there had to be something about those vines that was special and we want to preserve it. But then we did a further selection of individual plants, which we have planted in another vineyard, four different uh, clones per row in order to study them. And then out of those, we uh, made a selection of vines that had smaller berries, not yields that were not too low, not too high, uh, good quality. And we planted actually everything, you know, we do clones, masal, selection of 135 in each one of our vineyards because you know what one of the, the important things I think with all this research that's happening is that it's rather recent so you know I still think that there's so much I don't know about this vineyard we started studying microbial populations in the last five years we, we did a collaboration with micro wine which is a, a project that's really interesting actually done by the European Union with some sponsorship from yeast manufacturers but they actually studied microbes in the soil and things like phylloxera all over the world. There's actually collaboration from UK, somebody from Warwick studying phylloxera. There's people from Australia. And all this research is rather recent. You know, even yeah. something like this, what Dylan did, I actually was not aware of his research, which is so fascinating. Mm. And we, we have to keep these old vines alive mm. because we, you know, we might find that actually the, this, the secret sauce to what Dylan found, these old vines that survive so well, is in the microbes in, in the soil. I'd love to know from Dylan. Maybe Dylan, you can put in the chat uh, <laughs> if you've done some research on the microbes. So Maybe it's actually the microbes. Yeah. Tell us something else, Laura. I'm interested in, yeah. in, in to, to what extent do you think the quality of these two parcels, 18 yeah. and 20, is, is down to humidity in the soils? To humidity? Yeah, well, just how much water is ah, okay. in the soils so, in the proximity so, yeah, so, to the river. So actually, you know, the, this river used to be a river that had quite a bit of current and which would flood, you know, maybe every 10 years, the, it would actually, you know, the, the river would go all, all the way up and maybe flood a little bit. We, this river hasn't flooded for over 150 years. This region is a lot drier. So right now there is not water. We're, 
the picture that we saw here. It's an arroyo seco, is it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So no. So you will see. So up here, we haven't seen water for a very, very long time. And that's why you see some of the roots sticking out. Uh, you see there's a little bit of water because you see some of the grasses. Yeah. But the, the water hasn't gone up in my whole lifetime, all the way up to the vines. So it is possible that because there was more water access, this vineyard maybe survived a little bit better than some of the other parts. But this is, you know, you're, you're watching climate change here. You know, we have less water from the glaciers in Mendoza, and this vineyard is seeing less water because of that. So we actually have to irrigate it. Otherwise, this vineyard would die because we have less than eight inches of rainfall per year in Mendoza. C yes. Can you just, a couple of other things while we're looking yeah. at that uh, that picture. One, tell us about whether you're doing any any layering, these mugrones we've talked about. Yes. And also the, the irrigation regime you're using. Just maybe tell us a bit about... Yes. flood irrigation, you know, por merga, and then, and then yes. por surco, so by, by drip irrigation, and whether you're yes. using that. So this particular vineyard, anytime an old vine dies, we replace it with a mugron. That yeah. is uh, the traditional uh, way. And, you know, I actually was thinking a lot while watching Dylan's presentation that, you know, this is a fairly tightly spaced vineyard. It's a very different situation. And, you know, it's, it's not pruned in the arbolito which mm. I don't remember the name in English for Arbolito. So bush you know. vines, yeah? The bush vine, yes. Yeah. So this is not uh, in Arbolito. It never has been. Oh, maybe it, it might have been, you know, before, a lot before me. But yeah, so so in terms of the irrigation, I'll show a picture. So this is the, the flood irrigation in this vineyard. And, you know, most people who, who work in sustainability are rather horrified by this photo because it, <laughs> it looks like a, a very big waste of water. And it actually is. And there's also a lot of horrified people in France when they see this because they think we're practicing hydroponics, you know, like, you know, like those strawberries that you grow in, in your balcony. But actually, you know, flood irrigation is the traditional method in Argentina. We no longer plant any vineyards with flood irrigation because of sustainability and also because water is very expensive and limited. So well, not and only and from... And also because most of your vineyards now are on slopes, right? There are... All our, this is a this has a little bit of a slope, but most yeah. of our vineyards yeah. are on slopes, yeah. and also because you would not plant a vineyard to be flood irrigated mm -hmm. anymore because uh, there is limited water, especially in Mendoza, and you know every piece of land comes with a certain amount of water to it, and there's every day less, so we would always drip irrigate any uh, new vineyard, and in fact, part of this vineyard is drip irrigated, but in this part which is so old we decided to keep the flood irrigation uh, because we think the vines are so used to it and the soils are, are fairly heterogeneous. So, you know, we have some gravels in some places, some loams in others, and there's a subsoil of, of big rocks uh, because this was a riverbed in the past and the drainage is, is instant. So you, you're seeing this picture like this with all this water. If you go back the next day and it's been a little bit hot, there's no more water. It's, it's crazy how well the, the water drains. And, the concern for us is that these um, vines have really deep root systems. So the, the root systems go down over two meters. They have a lot of fine roots, which is my theory for why old vines, you know, make such great wine is that they have, you know, such a larger mass of fine roots than younger vines. And so they're able to absorb nutrients. They, they're able to withstand water stress. And in this case, the issue is not so much that these vines aren't strong while we use flood irrigation, but they've been used to this. Yeah. And when we've tried drip irrigation, we did try it in another sector of this vineyard, we lo lost quite a few vines. And so uh -huh. is it possible that if you could drip irrigate every vine differently, you know, if you could say this one gets 10, the other one gets five, the other one gets 20, depending on the soil, I'm sure you, you would be fine. You wouldn't you could replace the flood irrigation, but that's not how drip irrigation works. You don't do vine per vine. But, uh, so, so what you're what you're saying is that maybe if they've been drip irrigated from the start, I mean drip irrigation didn't actually, exist in the 1920s. You know the bucket system in a way you know, they were irrigated yeah. by bucket. Then yeah. they'd have got used to that. But this epigenetic yeah. memory means they've got used to flood irrigation. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that I would call it epigenetic yeah. memory, but it would yeah. be the root systems are already established. So if you think about yeah. a vine has, you know, a, a big root system and all of a sudden you stop giving water to, to half of it uh, yeah. or a certain vine gets a lot less than it used to get, it would probably uh, die. And, and I'd love to know actually from, from Dylan, the, in the vines in Australia, these vines that are the young and the old have the similar production. Mm you know, what, what the water situation is. And actually one interesting experiment that we did do 
is we compared the mugrones, you know, so the, the little daughter vines that had been born through the, the extension of, of, of a branch. I also forget the name of that, but, but we compared the yields and the quality for the mugrones, so the, the, layering, little yeah. the, the layered plants yeah. to the, um, the main mother vines. Mm. And what we found was that they were quite similar. So, you know, and so we had a vine that maybe, you know, was the daughter, the layered vine that was, you know, five years old. And it, it was quite similar. And th this was similar to what Dylan found, that they, they actually the, the daughter vine was quite similar in terms of yields and quality to the, um, the mother older vine. Yes. Yeah. I just wonder, anybody else watching, whether is Argentina unique in using flood irrigation? I mean, it's certainly the place I've seen it most often. Yes. Well, I, I don't know. I think that most vineyards were flood irrigated before drip irrigation in the whole world. And in Argentina, there's every time there's less uh, flood irrigation because of sustainability and water scarcity and water being expensive. I hope there's not a lot of flood irrigated places in the world because no. it's, it's definitely not good uh, for, you know, in terms of water resources. Yes. Could, could you just just one other thing with uh, just tell us about root systems do you find with yes. flood irrigation you get more superficial roots that the roots don't go as as deep or not so so i there is a notion that if you flood irrigate you would get very superficial root system and this is something that french i know there's probably some french people listening and i get really mad when they you know they say oh you irrigate your vineyard is crap you have no terroir and the reality is that we have such little water and such good drainage that even if you flood irrigate, the, the water is gone. And here in, in Angelica, the root systems are generally about two meters or more yeah. uh, because there is no underground water. So in, in many parts of, of the world, you actually have access to water for the vines. Our water is about 150 meters below. So we don't really have water access at all. And we have these big rocks and very good drainage. So we don't find that with, with drip or flood that we have you know, very shallow root systems because we don't irrigate you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Irrigation is basically you know, really mostly an art that people, it takes about 10 years to train somebody in a particular site. So the eye of the viticulturist, and you know, we use Scholander pump to measure water and, and all kinds of technology, but really it's, a person that knows the vineyard and will look uh, at the weather forecast and look at the vines and decide, okay, let's put some water. And we might water every day for a week mm. and not at all for a whole month. So it's, it's very, you know, according to what the vineyard looks like, how we decide watering. Could somebody just said, uh, is there a problem with salinity with, with flood? Yes, so we, we, you, you have more issues. We do have issues with salinity in this particular place and with flood, they can be worse. But also you can, so sometimes we will actually have drip irrigation that washes off the, the root system, that washes off the salts that, that we will add to a flood irrigated place. We haven't done that here because salinity is not as big of a problem, yeah. but uh, salinity is a problem with flood irrigation, yes. And, and one other question, it, 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 does this work best? Only possible for clay soils? Would, would, sandy soils, it wouldn't work. Presumably you'd, you'd lose the water too quickly. Right. So you? actually these are sandy soils. So in clay soils in Mendoza, flood irrigation is not good because it becomes too humid and because it absorbs the water. I, this actually has a little bit of, of clay. So in a pure clay soil or in a soil that has like 30% clay, like in Agrelo, for example, yeah. Tim, in, at the winery. Uh, the yeah, we have actually switched that whole vineyard, which in many parts, is dates back to the 80s so those are you know almost 40 year old vines we've switched all of that to drip irrigation it's not been a problem and because that soil has a lot of clay here we have more sand and more uh, stones and actually I, I think here flood irrigation in fact is more important because we need more water that you know and, and where you have clay you can use less water and the vine is still fine yeah. okay flood irrigation is used in Bolivia in the Sinti Valley oh. It's the only option yeah. the growers have. So you learn something doing these, aren't amazing? And Dylan's saying, agreeing with you, soil conditions are conducive, the roots will also go deep. Okay, Laura, next, next slide. Okay, so here's some photographs. And, you know, Malbec, even very old vines of Malbec don't get as thick as Shiraz. This, 
This one to the left might be the thickest vine I've ever seen, you know, because Malbec does not go big. Like Bonarda, I don't know, Tim, if you've seen Bonarda vineyards and they're just so thick, yeah. like the Grenache. I'm so jealous when I see the photos from Australia because they have, they have these big trunks and they, they're so attractive. Malbec, even old vine Malbec, like the one you see on the right, is often kind of scrawny and, and thin and, and you, you get like these really bent vines. So yeah, these are what these actual vines look like. What is the photo on the left, Laura? Just go back to that photo. Yeah. What's the one on the left? So they, they, they're actually both Malbec vines, old vines in Angelica. And, okay. and the, the left one was the thickest one I could find. And then the right one is more what they actually look like. And that's still um, from the 1920s. Do you know exactly when the vineyard yeah, was planted? Because so, so you, you bought it in the 30s, yeah? Yeah, so no, actually, we bought this vineyard in the 70s. This vineyard had been planted before. And, and, and you know, my grandfather bought it. He loved Malbec and he named it after his, his wife that had, had passed. But we actually have a record. The, the Argentine Institute of Viticulture, the INV, is fantastic. You know, um, this is... I, I don't want to talk politics because it's not good. And I have many complaints about the Argentine government, but actually the Institute of Viticulture in Mendoza is phenomenal. And it doesn't matter which government we have, you know, they are very serious about record keeping. They have records on all the vineyards, the yeah. age, when they were planted. So actually, and I'm very grateful because without this, we couldn't date this vineyard. So the first record of this vineyard is for nine, of, of wine being made from this vineyard is 1924, okay. which means yeah. that it was probably planted around 1920 because the yeah. first harvest would have been, you know, three to four years after. Yeah. So that's when we think that, that this vineyard um, was planted because there is a record, yes. Okay. There was one other question before we finish with yes. irrigation and water, that stuff, which was just the, the rainfall. I mean, it varies a lot, obviously, throughout yes. Mendoza. What would, the, what would the rainfall be in, in, in Maipú, you know, in Lunta, as opposed to, I don't know, Paltairi, where, where the Adriana vineyard is? Yeah, so this will be about, uh, I'll say it inches, it will be about eight inches, and in millimetres, 200 millimetres. So basically, uh, you, you, can't dry, you cannot dry farm. In, in some parts, like in Altamira, Eugenio Bustos, and Gualtajari, in, in the Uco Valley, we have more water, about twice as much. So we have closer to 400 millimetres, and some years even more. And La Carrera would be even more, be, be a thousand sometimes, wouldn't it? Mm, I don't know, if it's so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. 700, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, okay, so now, uh, so, lines, yeah. yes, okay, let me just put this image to the side, okay, is that, so that they can see the, the whole pictures. Okay, so this slide um, represents the kilo, kilogramos per, per plant is all the way to the left, so kilograms per plant is on the left side, we also have bricks on the, on the left column. And then in the bottom, you see the, the names of the cuttings. So remember, we were talking about 135 individual cuttings, which we had planted four per row. This, this data comes from the vineyard where we planted these cuttings. So this is not from Angelica, the old mine vineyard that, that I've been talking about. This is once we took this selection of 135 individual cuttings, we planted them one per row. And interestingly, we planted them in a place that has more clay soils that are a little more uniform. So Angelica is actually has, has a lot of heterogeneity. And to do these kind of clonal trials, you want to go to the soil that is most, you know, homogeneous. Mm. So that, you know, when you're looking at differences, you're not looking at terroir differences, mm. but you know, you're looking at differences in um, in the actual vines. Mm. So in the bottom, you'll see MB119, MB64, all the way to the left. And then you go all the way to the right, you see MB51. And the up on top, you see one bottle all the way to the left. And you see seven bottles, no, six bottles all the way to the right. And what that shows you is we are going from the lowest yielding to the highest yielding. So imagine, you know, for the winemakers in, in this room, you know, if you have a vineyard that some vines are producing the equivalent of one bottle and other vines are producing the equivalent of six bottles, it would generally be a disaster. You know, and this is why people plant clones, because the idea is let's get everything to ripen at the same time with the similar kind of yields. Um, 
you know, because this is how we will make the, be the better wine. And up on top, you see some uh, clusters just to show you how different the clusters are. So what we found in the selection uh, of 135 cuttings is that we had incredible diversity. We had less yields, more yields. We had some of the clusters. If you look at the number 26, you see what we call, and, and 105, you see what we call an alita. Alita is a little wing. Yeah. So some of the cuttings have alitas. Clone 120 in the picture here, that was a good year. Usually 120 has mille arrondage, which means that, you know, a third of the, of the grapes don't develop, which is actually good for quality because it's naturally low yields. And we, we actually really like this clone 120, which is very low yielding. So to look at, you know, how incredibly diverse is this population, you know, when we started this research in 1995, we, were, we thought that the result of this research would be that we would pick you know, these five or 15 cuttings, they would be, you know, high quality, ripen at the same time. And we would plant, you know, one block with uh, 120, one block with clone 80, and one block with each clone. But we also always planted the Massa selection in every place and also the 135 as sort of a research tool. And, and towards the beginning, we had less material, so we planted more Massal. And what we have found is that when you actually plant the whole population, even if you have different vines in terms of the yields, they actually ripen more consistently. So the vines come together in terms of bricks. You don't see this kind of difference that you see on this, you know, where you're going from you know, 24 um, to almost um, 28 bricks. You actually see more uniformity. And my theory, which you know, I, I need to figure out how to do this research is that the vines are actually talking to each other through their root systems and ripening together. So this is, I think, something that people are finding with massage selections all over the world, is that if you take the clone individually, you see these dramatic differences. But when the vineyard functions as a whole, you see vines kind of compensating for each other and the overall ripeness is more uniform than if you had planted each vine separately. So just tell us about what you've got planted in the Angelica vineyard then. So is, it, in, is, is it all original stuff with some layering or have you added some of these clones and some of these other massal selections? So, so if you look here at the, the Angelica vineyard, the 16, 17, 18 and 19 are all the original uh, population. So yeah. the, and these are all massal because the clonal selection is, was not happening you know, in the 1920s. I actually don't know when people started doing it, but at least not in Argentina. Mm. Um, and you know, there, there's a lot of other implications you know, for the viticultures in the room. You know, when you do a massa selection, you're, you're not doing virus testing, Tim. Mm. So you know, that's it, today in the world where there is a lot of virus, both in terms of the American rootstocks and the um, the vitis vinifera, mm. to do a massage selection is, is a rather risky undertaking because you, you can't take, you know, 300 individual plants and just reproduce them and not test them. We are actually testing the 135 mm. and we're going to reproduce them virus free and by meristematic reproduction, which is when you actually take a little bud and you reproduce it so that it's virus free. Mm. But what we did in the 1990s which was with no virus testing, to do it today would be, I don't know, millions of dollars, like very, very expensive. And so, you know, this is, I think, maybe the elephant in the room that, you know, you, we want to preserve these old vine selections, but we also have all these threats coming. So I think we need to figure out how to preserve some of it and study it and make sure it's virus free, preserve some of it, not caring about the viruses, because in some, you know, for example, if you're ungrafted, we have so, so many vineyards that are ungrafted where viruses do not significantly affect the production. So these vineyards are high functioning, you know, like as a doctor, I can tell you, you know, we, most humans have some virus at, at some time or other, we are, you know, colonized by bacteria, by viruses. And most of us are not seeing the effects of that until we get sick with the virus, you know, and so vines are rather similar. But doing this project and reproducing these massa selections, these 135 cuttings, it would be is a very expensive undertaking and something that you need to believe in. And my view is that if we don't preserve these old vines, if we don't preserve these populations, there might be some genes that are protected for climate change. So there might be a gene that helps us 
you know, with some new pest that comes around. Maybe there's some new nematode, nematode that we can be protected against, or maybe towards water stress. You know, we were talking about epigenetics. There's when we've studied the vines that grow at higher altitude, they have certain genes that are protected for UV radiation to the vines, which is higher at higher altitude. You know, for me, what's really important is preserving the old vines, but also preserving their genetic material because there may be something in that material that once we pull it out, it's no longer there. And, you know, in, in, as you know, Dylan said, in Australia, there's so many of these old vineyards that are ungrafted and there's all this genetic diversity that has been lost, you know, in, in, it, it, in many parts of Europe. To, 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 I mean, it, it, forgive me if this is a stupid question, but it may well be, but to what extent is it possible to clean up a mass hole selection? Can you clean it up for viruses or not? Well, so, you know, the, the difference between the 135 cuttings and mass hole selection is a little bit semantic. When you, when the definition of mass hole selection is that you just go look for some plants that look good, that you don't think there's wood disease, you know, you don't think they're, they've got a virus or any problem. <clears throat> And then you take the cuttings and you put them in little planters. And the thing that you plant is a, is a mix. You know, it might have more of one plant than another because one plant was a little more productive and you really liked it and you put a little more of that. When we do the 135, there's specific cuttings that we're reproducing in equal uh, numbers. So could you clean? Of course, you could clean a mass selection, but you'd have to do vine per vine virus testing. Then you'd have to plant it and take the material. That would be very expensive because... You don't just plant the first time you take it out. You have to keep on ch testing it Checking, because it yeah. could have gotten infected. So, and, and, and the thing is, I suppose, if you do clean it up, do you then change its DNA in a sense? I mean, do you, are you changing its personality? Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, Dylan was talking about the mugron, the little baby plant. Well, actually, you are right uh, that you could change the personality. And this is a point I wanted to make. Dylan was talking, when in his research, he saw that the little baby plant, the, what is it called, the mugron in English? the uh, layering the layering, layering. yeah uh, had the characteristics of the mother plant we also find that the cuttings have some of these epigenetic changes so for example we sent our vines to be studying our cuttings from high altitude to uc davis and they were compared to plants from france mm. that had been brought from france and we had all these epigenetic changes which we find at high altitude which is to deal with sunlight uvb rays which i'm sure in bolivia i know there's somebody from bolivia they probably have these too so actually, I don't think that when you take a cutting, you lose the epigenetic changes. Maybe you, you lose some, but you should be able to retain some. So yes, for sure, the new vineyard planted from an old vineyard will be different. Will you lose something? Yes, but you will not lose all the epigenetic changes. Yeah. Some interesting comments on, on, in, in the chat. Everybody have a look at those if you want to have a look Paul White commenting and Dylan and so people saying viruses are not helpful for plants. Thank you. From Borja. I, suppose, I think we, you talked about the elephant in the room. I think we should probably talk about yields. Just tell us a little bit okay. about yields from these old vines, because it sounds to me, is from what you said at the beginning, that you were quite surprised by, by Dylan's findings. Okay, different place, different variety, different vineyards. But just tell us about your experience with yields and these old vines with Malbec. Yeah, so, you know, for sure in Mendoza, old vines are lower yielding than younger vines. And, you know, I would, I would say this starts happening over 30 years age. So, you know, the, the highest yields usually start happening around seven years of the vine. And, you know, at 10, 15, 20s, you know, it's wonderful because you have great balance, good quality. But over about 30 years, we start seeing some reduction in yields. And remember, we're talking 90 something percent grafted for Malbec, sorry, ungrafted, ungrafted for Malbec in Argentina. So there's some, so for example, the people from LVMH, from Chandon, they, and they're from France, they have been grafting everything in Argentina because they're worried of what will happen. You know, maybe we do get phylloxera, but you know, it's the custom in France. If most of the local vineyards are ungrafted for Malbec, but it, when we plant Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, we usually graft because it's so dry that uh, the Pinot Noir doesn't have such a deep root system like Malbec, and it will not survive in the very gravelly soils. So now back to your question about age. For sure, we do not see what Dylan sees in Australia. And I don't know if maybe it's that the density is higher. We do have some wood disease, but less wood disease than they have in Europe. 
uh, or in the US, we've actually studied this. Why, why do the old vines produce less? You know, it's a mixture of things. You know, some of them it is related to wood disease, but some of them they just produce less. And honestly, I don't, I don't know, I don't have an explanation. We, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in microbial uh, soil. You know, is it possible? I mean, this is what Dylan said about more research being needed. I think we need to do so much more research because, you know, maybe we've actually identified some microbes that are very protective, you know, rhizobacteria. And we actually, we did a really cool research where we took microbes from a certain soil that were identified as rhizobacteria. And then we took cuttings and we planted them in two pots. And the one that had the rhizobacteria was much, had many more leaves, better color, the plant looks so much healthier. And this is something that, you know, other farmers for other crops do a lot of, you know, inoculating with fungi, with microbes, with different things. In, in viticulture, there's some people experimenting, but very little. But what if you could take something that works in your terroir, so in your climate soil combination, and add it to these old vines, you know, maybe you can get old vines to last longer. And maybe in Australia, there's something about the way they plant their vineyards or they maintain them. But that's extraordinary what Dylan has found. I, I'd love to know if there's any French people in the room, people from Chile. I saw that there was somebody from Chile, what their experience is. Because there's for us, for sure. Interesting, interesting point about the Sangiovese. There's a, there's a what Ian Dagata, who's a, a, a fantastic Italian expert, says unofficially popular, but banned clones of Sangiovese. One of the best is virus affected producers find it gives better quality grapes, yeah? Um, yeah, so, so actually that, you know, Alejandro Vigil, our, our, our head winemaker, he, he's also sort of, he thinks we shouldn't go too crazy with, with the virus obsession. He yeah. thinks that, in fact, some of these viruses lower yields, and if you lower yields a little bit, your quality goes up. I mean, any person who owns a vineyard knows that uh, your best vineyards are generally lower yielding i've we've never had a very very high yielding vineyard that was extraordinary quality you know there's also a range you know but for example here we're talking about you know two tons per hectare maybe a little more this vineyard and you know the this same massal selection planted in adriana is is at least double and in 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 paragel damira which has you know a little richer soils it's three times as productive so, you know, Tim, I, I don't have, I, I'm jealous of, of Australia at this point, because I wish we, we had these old vines being, you know, more productive. I mean, Jaco Engelbrecht made a very good point, and, and I'm not a scientist, but he said you need to specify which virus, that leaf roll virus, which is oh. obviously highly de detrimental, I think, to quality and yield. Yes. Uh, in particularly in South Africa yeah. is, is certainly one of them. Yeah. So are there, well, maybe there are good, good and less good no, viruses. I don't know. Well, no, absolutely. And so there's one called Pinot uh, Gris virus that comes uh, from Italy, probably. Yeah. Although I don't want to blame it. I don't want to get into the where the virus blame comes Pinot from. Blame. It's, it's to blame for uh, lots but, of things in the world. But, but but but, you know, this virus is not a big problem. Now, the interesting thing, Tim, is that a virus can be a big problem in one country and less of a big problem in another country. Mm -hmm. the, and I, we don't, I don't think anybody knows why, but yeah, so some of the viruses are horrible. And when you do a panel of viruses, you usually pick, you know, a certain number of viruses and you pick all the bad ones. But the other problem, Tim, is that every day they're finding some new virus that can affect the vines. Mm -hmm. So, but I agree with a balance between cleaning material and not going so crazy with this that you you basically want to pull everything out and yeah. you reduce the genetic diversity. So I think we need to find a, a balance mm. between all the virus cleaning and, you know, preserving some of these selections. And, you know, there might be, you know, new technology in the future that mm. helps us figure out this virus issue in a better way than, than we do it now. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure where we are in the slides. It's been such okay, a fascinating so conversation. We, we, got, we got sidetracked. <laughs> okay, so here's the Adriana Vineyard. So this is uh, the place where we have taken the Massad selection as well as uh, the clones and planted them at much higher altitude. And, you know, th this is, you know, the, the incredible thing about vineyards that you can preserve them if you do a Massad selection and if you do a population selection. And I think that it's something that you need to realize if you don't do it, when you're pulling out the vineyard, you'll never be able to do it. And I think there, there, that's one of the good things about this conference is that there, there is creating consciousness that before you, you, you pull out one of these old vine vineyards of which there's not that many left in the world, 
that you make sure that you preserve uh, the Massat selection. And so what we've done is, first of all, we took the Massat selection and the clones and we planted them in four different vineyards in different areas, which is also interesting because we might find that some of the cuttings do better in one altitude versus another one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people ask me, you know, what are you doing with climate change? And actually the interesting thing is that what Argentina did about climate change was before we knew there was climate change, really, because it was, you know, in the 1980s, my father was looking for wines with better acidity. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for cooler climate because, uh, you know, our friend Jacques Lorton said that our Cabernet tasted like it was from the Languedoc, you know. So my father said, OK, uh, I know what that means. It means it's too hot. Let's go look for cooler climate. Now, with climate change, which we do have it in South America, it's not as severe as some parts of North America, but it's definitely real. It's not just the temperature, we also have less, you know, planting these vineyards at higher altitude is a way to preserve them against climate change, preserving the genetic um, diversity. And I think that this work of preserving, because you don't know, if you get rid of something now, you, you will never have it again, you know? So either preserving the vineyard itself or preserving the Massa selection in another place is very important. Now, what we're doing now because of all these virus issues is that we have a nursery, which is isolated, where we are doing all the vines are tested and we're doing meristematic you know, reproduction. But my hope is that there will be new technology with viruses, especially helped by the human problems. So anytime they, there's a human virus problem, we learn more about viruses. And that also helps the vines because you know, viruses are viruses. So the ways you, you test for them, the way you detect them, any technology advancement in humans can be transferred to, to farming. And so my hope is that we will have, you know, less expensive solutions so that we can preserve all this material and, and this, this beauty of, of, you know, of viticulture for the world. I mean, some people are very pessimistic because of these virus issues. I think, you know, we already were saved from phylloxera, you know, in many ways, you know, think of Europe, you, there would be no vineyards if it weren't for the, the, the grafting, you know, so yeah, I think that we need to have an eye on preserving things, knowing that there will be more technology in the future that can help us. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Oh, there so we go. this is, oh, we're almost done. So this is just a, a project that's very dear to my heart, which is the Rosas Vineyard, which was planted around the, the turn of the century, uh, you know, so older than the Angelica Vineyard. And this is the Carlos Rosas is all the way at the top. And this is a vineyard that when I started looking for, for grapes for a project I have called Luca Wines, I was looking for old vines and I found this vineyard that was actually you know, a, a low trellis like they have in France, but which is rare in Mendoza because of frost. Usually the vineyards are higher. And they were actually planning to pull this vineyard out in the 90s. And we convinced the, the owner until 1916, um, sorry, until 2016 to not pull out the vineyard. So we had 20 years of these glorious grapes. These grapes used to go to bulk wine before I started working with it because there was no appreciation for the specialness of this this place but then finally in 2016 he we couldn't convince him anymore you know i would go every day and drink wine and you know try to convince him don't pull it out this year finally he decided to pull it out but he was very happy that we wanted to preserve the selection so we've actually taken this selection from the rosas vineyard and we have planted it in guatajari alto which is a place you know so the rosas vineyard is in the south of the Uca valley this is you know a little over 1500 meters elevation this beautiful place and now this vineyard lives in another location and it's it's a massage selection from rosas and it makes me very happy that we haven't lost that, that beauty. And, and I made a deal with Carlos also that every year we will give him, uh, you know, a couple of cases of wine from his plant selection. And, and he's actually allowed us to use Rosa's selection on our labels, which is also, I think, quite wonderful. Fantastic. Sarah's just shared with us the, the quote from Ian Daggett's book, which is wonderful, basically saying that it's, that, 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 as we said, that Sangiovese clone is not officially permitted, but that doesn't stop anyone in Italy using it. Ho, ho. <laughs> Sarah, back to you. Thank you, Laura. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. And Thank everybody. you. Especially Thank for you. sharing your time with us on your holiday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's a family yes. winery, never on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Lara, and thank you, Tim. And uh, Lara, thank you for sharing your really fascinating research. And I think that I really liked her, your curiosity, your pragmatism and the aspiration. And I think that gives a really valuable perspective. I think it's important to nurture old vine heritage, not just because of the symbolism, although that's powerful, not just because of the quality or the terroir expression, although that's obviously powerful, I think it's also important, as you've expressed, for the challenges that, that are coming that we don't even know about. And I had a chat this week on LinkedIn with the technical director at Cheval Blanc. It's amazing. <laughs> this is the thing, do. mini, as you do, um, about old vines. And his point was that, and, and Cheval Blanc have some very old vines, very old vine Cabernet Franc. And his point is that the material is essential for the future. And in fact, we pick up more on that, in fact, with the tomorrow's uh, conference. So uh, thank you very much. And we had uh, your Catena Alta Malbec at a tasting of Old Vine Wine at 67 Palmal last night. And it tasted absolutely sensational. And it had that tingling vitality that I think is the thread of all good Old Vine wine.